Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to Open Educational Resources and Universal Design for Learning. And we are grateful today to have a presentation by Josie Gray from BC Campus. Um, I'll just begin with the land acknowledgement here. Welcome, Edlanate, Aninsikwa, Tawau, Haukoda, and Tansi. Saskatchewan Polytechnic campuses are situated on Treaty 4 and Treaty 6 territory and the homelands of the Métis Nation. We respectfully recognize the Indigenous peoples of these lands as part of our ongoing commitments to good relations and a reconciled future. We welcome and acknowledge everyone joining us today. So just a little bit of housekeeping. This session is uh, supposed to be recorded and it should be posted to the SAS Poly YouTube channel with an open license and the recording will be available for you to use and share and then um, the web address will be emailed out to you uh, when it becomes available. Questions, you can add them to the chat and Josie will address them at the end of the presentation. And we are welcoming attendance from both um, SAS Poly and the um, external and international community today. And also please keep your mic muted during the presentation. Um, oops, that's for at the end. And I'm going to stop sharing now and welcome Josie and Josie can introduce herself. So hello everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to attend this session on the relationship between OER or Open Educational Resources and Universal Design for Learning, or UDL. It's one of my favorite topics to discuss. So a really big thank you to Saskatchewan Polytechnic for this invitation and also to all of you for being here. My slides are under Creative Commons Attribution License unless otherwise noted. So you're welcome to share, reuse and remix the content of these slides in the future as long as you attribute me. To start, I wanna share a little bit about myself. My name is Josie Gray. My pronouns are she, her. I am a thin white woman in my late twenties. I have mid-length, light colored hair, glasses, and a septum piercing. I work at BC campus, an organization in British Columbia that is funded by the provincial government to support digital teaching and learning in the post-secondary system in BC. I work on the open education team where I've been for over seven years. In my role, I oversee the BC Open Collection, which is a collection of over 350 open textbooks and open courses. I also manage a small team that supports faculty and staff in BC use, create, and adapt open educational resources. As such, I know a lot about open licenses and press books and accessibility in the context of digital educational resources. I have a Master's of Design in Inclusive Design from OCAD University in Toronto. And as part of my master's work, I produced a podcast that looked at knowledge justice and knowledge equity in the context of open education. So my interest and commitment to equity in open education includes multiple lenses. I am joining you all today from Lac La Biche, which is located in the very northern part of Treaty 6 in Alberta. Uh, the county of Lac La Biche is part, also part of Treaty 8 and Treaty 10, but I am personally on Treaty 6 today, as well as Region 1 of the Métis Nation of Alberta. Uh, treaty 6 was signed in 1876, one of the 11 numbered treaties signed between the First Nations and the British Crown. Uh, one of the provisions of this treaty was that Indigenous peoples had the right to continue their hunting and fishing practices. Um, there is a lot of industry in Northern Alberta, especially oil and gas. And in 2008, the Beaver Lake Cree Nation, who are currently based just south of Lac La Biche, filed a statement of claim against the Alberta provincial and Canadian federal governments, arguing that those governments have failed to manage the overall cumulative environmental effects of development of their traditional territory, and as such have violated the provision in Treaty 6 that guaranteed those hunting, fishing, and trapping rights. On their website, the Beaver Lake Cree Nation says, quote, our lands used to be home to large herds of moose, caribou, and elk. Hundreds of freshwater lakes and rivers provided clean water and abundance of healthy fish, but now cumulative impacts from industry and development have poisoned water, eliminated whole forests, and decimated tr traditional food sources for the Beaver Lake Cree Nation people. We had to act. Beaver Lake Cree Nation is the first ever to challenge and be granted a trial on the cumulative impacts of industrial development, 
not one project, not one mine, but all of them at once. Uh, from what I can find online, this case is still yet to be tried, but I wanted to highlight the work that Beaver Lake Cree Nation is doing to hold governments accountable to treaty promises. And it's something that I'll be keeping an eye out for myself. So today I want to discuss open educational resources and universal design for learning and explore how these practices can complement each other to support student success. So what kind of things impact student success in a given course? All sorts of things really, I've got a big list on the slide, not comprehensive at all, but just some things to consider. Uh, examples include day-to-day -day life, digital literacy, access to technology, disability, finances, caregiving responsibilities, mental health, family support, interest in the subject, experiences of discrimination versus privilege, living situation, and many, many other things. And all of these specific things will vary great, greatly from student to student. Many of these things are completely outside of an individual instructor's control, uh, but since we are focused on educational resources today, I want to explore ways that instructors can design educational resources so they are flexible and customizable, which lead to reducing barriers that a student might experience when trying to engage with or learn from a specific resource. A concept that I find really helpful when thinking about the range of barriers that students face is the social model of disability and how it contrasts with the medical model of disability. These are not the only frameworks for understanding disability, but I find they provide helpful distinctions when considering how we can best support students in post-secondary environments. So the medical model of disability understands disability as an individual problem, affliction, or deficit that needs a cure or accommodation. It sees disability as grounded in the individual. This is the model that is used in medical settings, and it is also used at universities and colleges where students need to have a diagnosed disability to be eligible for accommodations. In contrast, the social model of disability sees disability emerging when there's a mismatch between a person and their environment. So with this view, disability becomes more of a spectrum that can affect different people in different ways, depending on their context, their environment, the tools they have access to, and is a product of history and culture. So what is the result of these different models in the context of post-secondary education? With the medical model, the onus is on the student to request accommodations. To do this, they need to have a diagnosed disability and be registered with the Accessibility Services Office at the institution. This is generally a process that requires a lot of self-advocacy and administration on the part of the student. And even then, students may not get all of the supports they need to be successful. In addition, this model does not guarantee that instructors change their practices going forward and only the student who made the request receives the accommodation, even though there may be other students whose ability to learn may improve if they were to receive those accommodations, but because they don't have a diagnosis, it is not extended to them. Oops, sorry, going too fast. With the social model, the responsibility shifts from the student to the person designing the learning experience to reduce or eliminate barriers from the beginning. So rather than assuming all students are the same, it's assumed that students are different and have a variety of access needs and preferences based on their bodies, minds, and context. The diversity of students is not something to be ignored or downplayed, but rather something to be designed for. There may still be cases where students need accommodations, but that information is then used to improve the learning design going forward. So while we're not specifically talking about disability today, the social model of disability is help a helpful framework to keep in mind when talking about OER and UDL, as it encourages proactive design to support the diverse needs of students, including students with disabilities. So let's get to our first main concept to explore today, Open Educational Resources, or OER. These are educational resources that are shared under an open license. The open license indicates that the copyright holder of the resource has given permission for anyone to use, edit, and share the resource for free. 
There are a number of characteristics of OER that I think make OER stand out from traditional educational resources. So the first and most obvious is the open license, which allows for the free sharing and editing of content. The second is digital first design. It is much easier to share and edit content if it is digital. So generally OER are designed with the intention of them being used and shared on digital devices, although some can be printed as well. This is important because it allows for flexibility and customization that is not possible in print, and it enables some of the additional characteristics of OER that I will talk about. Third is OER is generally supported by open source technologies. It is completely possible to create OER on commercial platforms, but it is the open source tools that have really allowed OER to grow and flourish. In today's presentation, I will talk a lot about two open tools that are used a lot for a lot of OER, and that is Pressbooks, which is an open source self-publishing tool that is often used to create open textbooks, as well as H5P, which is a tool that makes it easy to create interactive content to support student learning. Fourth is multiple formats. So for example, resources published in Pressbooks can be accessed as a web book or as a PDF that can be read on a computer or printed or an EPUB that can be read on any digital device, including phones and e-readers. And the formats that OER are generally available in don't require a paid software or a specific device or operating system to be able to open and access the content. Fifth is multimedia. I mentioned that OER published in Pressbooks are available as web books. The web books support text and image images, but they also allow you to directly embed video, audio, and animations for students to engage with directly into the book. Sixth is that because of the open licenses and digital formats, OER are free to students. And finally, the open licenses give instructors greater agency over their course materials as they are able to customize OER or create their own OER or remix multiple OER together. Our second main topic to explore today is Universal Design for Learning or UDL. UDL is a useful framework that encourages flexible learning design and designing for student variability. UDL encourages designing teaching and learning environments and materials, so they provide choice and flexibility for students. UDL has three principles. They are multiple means of engagement, multiple means of representation, and multiple means of action and expression for students. So engagement is the why of learning, and it looks at designing learning experiences in different ways so students are motivated to learn. Representation is the what of learning. It looks at how the content is being presented to students and aims to give students options and how they engage with content. And then third is action and expression, which is the how of learning. And that looks at the options student have, students have for demonstrating and managing their knowledge and learning. Now, since we're talking about educational resources, I'm going to, for this session, focus on the idea of providing multiple means of representation, since that is the guideline that applies to the design of educational materials. So for this principle, Universal Design for Learning provides three guidelines. They are perception, language and symbols, and comprehension. So I'm gonna go through each of those three guidelines to uh, show more specifically what they are talking about. The first guideline is perception, which has to do with providing options for students to interact with content that doesn't rely on a single sense, like sight, hearing, movement, or touch. Many of these things closely relate to web content accessibility guidelines, which are guidelines to make web content accessible to people with disabilities. However, a key aspect of the perception guideline is user choice and the ability to customize. So this includes offering ways to customize the display of information, like changing the size and spacing of things like images and text, changing colors and increasing color contrast, adjusting the speed of audio in recordings or text-to-speech tools, and changing font. So these are all things that are generally possible for digital content, depending on the platform that the digital content is in. 
The next is to provide alternatives for auditory information. This can include providing transcripts and captions for video and audio, but can also include American Sign Language, uh, visual representations like sheet music or emojis, or visual and tactile experiences for sound effects like vibrations. And finally, offer alternatives for visual information. So this can include text descriptions for images, audio versions of text, tactile graphics, and 3D representations. So with all of these things, the purpose is to offer students options in how they engage with the content and the ability to customize for themselves. So to address this guideline, educational resources have to be available as a digital format, as digital allows the reader to adjust the display of text and colors and use assistive technology to read content and as well as engage with multimedia. The second guideline is around the use of languages and symbols to establish a shared understanding of the topics being discussed. This includes clarifying vocabulary and symbols by providing definition lists or symbol legends with alternative text descriptions, clarifying syntax and structure, supporting the decoding of text, mathematical notation and symbols, such as through text-to-speech, which I'll talk about more in a few minutes, and per promote understanding across languages. So for example, by providing definitions of key terms in students' first languages. Um, illustrating through multiple media. So for example, represent a concept in two different ways, like a text explanation and a video demonstration. Ultimately, this involves bringing in supports into the resource to help students understand new concepts and terminology. The final guideline is around comprehension to support students in constructing meaning and generating new understanding. So this includes providing background information and context and supporting students in bringing in their own knowledge. Also highlighting patterns, uh, critical features, big ideas and relationships. Um, also uh, guiding information processing and visual visualization and maximizing transfer and generalization. So ultimately, this concept is about supporting students in learning a subject or topic as a whole and connecting ideas together. So now that I've kind of given some background about OER and UDL's principle of um, multiple means of representation, I wanted to look at them kind of side by side. They have two things in common. They both encourage a digital first design, and they are both centered on students. And then they each have a number of characteristics that distinguish them on their own. So for OER, this includes open licenses, multiple formats, supported by open technologies like Pressbooks and H5P, free to students, and greater instructor agency. And for UDL, this includes giving students choice and flexibility, supporting learning through design, and also a disability lens, so accessible design and assuming diversity. So when using UDL and OER together, I believe they make each other stronger, either by filling in gaps not addressed by the other or by enabling practices encouraged by the other. So I wanted to look at some examples of UDL's principle of representation being applied to OER. All of these examples are based on OER that have been published in Pressbooks, which as I mentioned, is an open source tool designed to support the creation of open textbooks. So the first UDL guideline talked about perception, which has to do with providing options for students to interact with content that doesn't rely on a single sense. So one way to support perception is to provide content in multiple modalities by combining text, images, video, audio, and interactivity to give students multiple ways to engage with content. So for example, uh, text-to-speech, audiobooks, videos, and H5P activities. So let's look through some examples. Okay, so this video that I'm gonna play in just a second shows a text-to-speech tool that is available by default in Firefox called Reader View. It allows you to customize the display of text on a web page as well as read, have that text read out loud. In this example, I've enabled Reader View in an open textbook published in Pressbooks. So we are looking at a chapter in the web book. Linear measurement can be defined as a measure of length, the length. 
of a table, the length of a piece of pipe and the length of a football field are all examples of linear measurement. We might also refer to it as distance. Lin so other browsers have similar text-to-speech tools. For example, Chrome has many text-to-speech browser extensions that do similar things. In addition, programs like Adobe Reader and Microsoft Word also have built-in text-to-speech capabilities. So I'd recommend experimenting with these tools for yourself if you're not familiar with them, and also sharing them with your stu students who may not know that they exist. And so this just shows how by putting educational content on the web, um, that the display can be customized and the text read aloud by browser tools. And one way to do that is through Pressbooks. So here I have an example of an audio version of a Math for Trades open textbook. The authors wrote the textbook and then narrated each chapter. And those recordings were compiled in a playlist in the video hosting platform Kaltura where they can be listened to directly there. Linear measurement can be defined as a measure of length. The length of a table, the length of a piece of pipe, and the length of a football field are all examples of linear measurement. And then the recordings were also embedded directly in the open textbook, which was published in Pressbooks. So students can easily find the recordings and they can listen along as they read. Linear measurement can be defined as a measure of length. The length of a table, the length of a piece of pipe, and the length of a football field are all examples of linear measurement. Here is an example of math content in Pressbooks that is written using the LaTeX markup language and then rendered with MathJax. One of the features of MathJax is it allows users to customize the display of math content. So one way this works is you can right click any of the math equations, select math settings and go down to scale all math and then enter a percent value for what you'd like the math to be scaled to. So in this case, I changed 100% to 200% and that caused all of the equations to double in size. To change it back, I right click, select math settings, go down to scale all math and change the 200% back to 100%. You can also set the zoom, so only select equation zoom. So again, right click, going to math settings and then zoom trigger. And here is where you select what you want to cause the equation to zoom. So right now it's set to no zoom, but I'm changing it. Uh, you can change it to either hover, click or double click. And I'm gonna select click so that when I click on an equation, it enlarges based on the zoom factor, which is also something that can be customized in math settings. And here is another example of how MathJax can make math equations more accessible. This video shows content in a math textbook that is written in LaTeX and rendered with MathJax. MathJax translates the equation into MathML, which can be read by a screen reader. So in this example, I'm using the NVDA screen reader. And this video shows how the NVDA screen reader interprets the equation. What you do here is take the number of cubic inches you have and divide it by the number of cubic inches there are in one cubic foot. Three lines, line one, foot cubed equals the fraction with numerator in cubed and denominator in cubed divided by yft cubed. Line two, feet cubed equals the fraction with numerator 2652 in cubed and denominator 1728 and divided by yft. The second guideline was about language and symbols. So one way that Pressbooks supports this feature is they have a tool by, sorry, they have a tool for handling glossary terms. So the authors of this book used Press, the Pressbooks glossary tool to provide definitions for key terms linked directly in the text. So the terms that are glossary terms appear bold, dark red with a dotted underline. So when a student selects one of those terms, the definition for the term pops up. In this screenshot, the terms voltage, current, and resistance are all marked as glossary terms, and the definition for voltage is displaying. In addition, 
a full list of glossary terms and their definitions are provided at the back of the book. And here I have an example of a video tutorial that a, a instructor in BC made to demonstrate different hairstyling techniques. The videos don't have sound, but they show an instructor demoing different hair coloring and bleaching techniques on a mannequin. So this is an example of something that would be very difficult to demonstrate with just images and text. And so by providing a video demo like this, students can watch exactly how the technique should be done as many times as they want. How information is organized and structured in an educational resource plays an important role in comprehension. So that means it's important to think about how you'll scaffold new knowledge, consider how people might navigate the resource, pay attention to the number of chapters, the titles, and the use of sections and subsections, establish numbering systems for headings, figures, and tables, and ensure chapters have consistent elements and structure. What Exactly what this looks like will vary greatly depending on the educational resource, but the more intentional you are about thinking about structure and organization and navigation, the more useful and powerful a resource can be, which can help increase access. Another way to support comprehension is through the intentional use of text boxes, which can be a great way to draw attention to key information that supports the main body of a text. So for example, text boxes can highlight the most important ideas of a section. They can walk through key processes or procedures and provide concrete examples or case studies to support main ideas. So in the screenshot on the slide here, uh, there is a purple text box that contains an example of translating a ratio into higher terms. Over the next few slides, I will be showing examples of different H5P activities that instructors have created to support students in comprehending different subjects. H5P is a tool that allows you to create web-based interactive activities and formative assessments. It is a tool enabled in Pressbooks that allows you to build these interactive activities and reuse activities created by others in Pressbooks and embed them directly in the webbook. Uh, for more information about H5P, you can visit their website at h5p.org. You can also check out the H5P Pressbooks Kitchen at kitchen.opened.ca. This is a site created and maintained by Alan Levine, and it was used to support people who had received grants from BC campus to create H5P activities for existing open textbooks. The project is done now, but the site still has lots of great resources around H5P. So here is one activity taken from a Writing for Success open textbook. It asks students to identify all of the sentence fragments in the in, out of 10 options. In this screenshot, I've selected all the ones I think are sentence fragments. And when I click the check button, the activity will let me know which ones I got right and which ones I got wrong. So this allows students to self-assess their understanding of sentence fragments as they're working through their learning. Here is another example from a vital signs measurement open textbook. It shows an interactive video activity that's demonstrating hand washing. So for this activity, students watch the video and then the video pauses at different points to ask questions or to provide more information. And the final activity I will show is image hotspots, which allows you to directly label an image. In this example, which appears in a business writing textbook, a sample document is provided to illustrate how to write clearly. Different parts of the document are labeled, like the title, headings, topic and transition sentences, and bulleted lists. And when someone clicks those hotspots, more information about each of those items and how they should be used is provided. If you want to dig more into Universal Design for Learning in more detail, I would recommend starting at the website located at udlguidelines.cast.org. There you will be able to explore all of the principles, read about the guidelines and checkpoints, and they provide a lot more concrete examples about each principle. So it's a, a good resource to check out for UDL support. 
So to conclude, I want to pull together the lessons that UDL and OER can learn from each other. This is not to say that the people working in these spaces don't already know these things or aren't already doing these things. It's just looking at what is missing from the popular frameworks surrounding each of these ideas, if you look at them just on their own. So three things that OER can learn from UDL. In open education, people talk about accessibility often just in terms of the resource being free. So for example, a phrase I hear sometimes is that OER is freely accessible online, just meaning that people can find it on the internet for free, not that it's actually accessible to students with disabilities. So UDL shows us that free isn't enough. Resources must be design, designed to be accessible to students with disabilities, and doing so will make the resource easier to use and engage with for all students. Second is that multiple formats give students choice and flexibility, and that's a really valuable thing to do. It's worth, it's worth doing in OER, putting out those multiple formats. And the third is that it's worthwhile to put time into making resources more multimodal and interactive. So moving away from you know, just text and images, putting time into creating those uh, multimodal activities and interactive activities is can support student learning. And if I were to sum up these three lessons, it would be that how we design OER matters. The design of the resource can greatly impact student learning and student success. Three lessons that UDL can learn from OER are uh, there are open tools available that support UDL practices like Pressbooks and H5P. Second is that open licenses make it easier for instructors to share work and find educational resources, including ones designed with UDL in mind. And third is that cost is a real and big barrier for students. So being able to use OER to lower cost can be really valuable for learners. And that is all I have for you today. So I'd love to pause for questions, thoughts. Just gonna open up the chat to see if stuff has come in so far. Thank you, Donna, for sharing links. One question that, that did come up in the chat um, was what happens if people miss the hotspot, one of the hotspots? And I think, I mean, that's kind of a new um, format for, for many of us when we're, we're looking at H5P. Um, so just looking for a little bit more information on, on the hotspots, I think, as, as one of the H5P modules. Yeah, that's a great, great point. Like if your students are unfamiliar with these kind of activities, they might not know that they can click those plus signs. I would say that this is a screenshot. So the resolution isn't as good. It looks more obvious that these are clickable in the actual activity. Um, but one way to address that would be to include a explanation previous to the activity, something like complete the following activity, click on the plus signs for more information. That would just prompt students that they should go in and click. So that's something that could be added. Um, H5P activities, a lot of them are also designed to be accessible and work with assistive technologies. So a student using a, an assistive technology will be able to use their screen reader, for example, to navigate between the plus signs as well. Other questions, feel free to put them in the chat or if you'd like to unmute that you're also welcome to do that as well. I'm going to mention that we have quite a number of people that are attending from our um, UDL hub. And um, so I think for, for us at SAS Polytechnic, um, that's really interesting to have the two slides, particularly on the, um, the relationship between UDL and OER. And our two worlds have maybe not collided 
uh, quite as much as they needed to at that point. So I find find that really helpful just to think about um, how these two areas should be working together and how OER supports UDL if, if we allow it to, if we put it in place and how OER um, provides more of the context for UDL. Absolutely. I question, but I, I just think it's fascinating yeah. these two fit together so well and support each other. I, I really think they do. And I think like, so I started in OER especially doing a lot of work around accessibility and then discovered UDL. And so I might be coming at it from a different place than some of you who might be coming from UDL to OER. Um, so I, I do find there's they work together really well. And for people that are coming from OER and are new to UDL, UDL is a great place to go to if you're trying to figure out how to move away from just text-based resources, which is what a lot of, which is what traditional textbooks are made to be used. Lots of text with images. They're not made generally to be interactive or flexible or responsive. So bringing UDL into OER can be really helpful as a way to kind of think beyond what a traditional textbook is and can be. And um, yeah, oh, and um, I think OER and open in general, open technologies that are support that can support UDL. It's good to know that those exist um, because they can allow things to be done in different ways and more accessible ways and no cost to students. So yeah, I think there's really good alignment between the two concepts. And I think if I had a question, maybe maybe I'm, I'm still forming exactly what the question is. But I think we think of UDL probably more just in terms of uh, direct classroom instruction, you know, and that's that's really where we, um, I think, maybe been more focused as in, within SAS Polytechnic, although I'm relatively new, so someone else is welcome to jump in and correct me on that. Um, but I think um, it would be really interesting to hear a little bit more. You said you, you had sort of stepped into the UDL world and uh, discovered that, that this coincidence and where there was really good synergy between the two. Um, but overall, like, uh, I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about that experience and particularly related to the classroom instruction and, and how we can, because these concepts, I mean, really we're, we're taking OER as, as sort of a, a mechanism which allows us to achieve our UDL goals, but, um, Really, there's so many other mechanisms within education that we need to be looking at when we're we're wanting to incorporate UDL principles. Is that a question? No, maybe not yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's a great thought, um, and I like I think what I covered today, especially with relation to UDL, is a third of what UDL is. Like I focused on the multiple means of representation, which all of the kind of sub principles of that is very much focused on the educational resources, the content you're sharing in the classroom. It's not as much about teaching practice, but UDL has a huge part of it that is about teaching practice. Um, but because I am very much in the OER world, it's this principle of representation that I'm most familiar with and can speak to directly. Um, but I know there's lots of people that have lots of expertise around more of the, the pedagogy side and the teaching side in the classroom, but that's not the area that I can really speak to. Maybe where I'll go with that is just to mention, and, and Barb has the, um, the slides, the SAS Polytechnic slides, but there is an event that's gonna be coming up um, during May, uh, there is, we, we actually have a week recognizing um, Universal Design for Learning uh, last week in May. And so we have quite a number of, I'll just mention right now, the slide will pop up later, but we have quite a number of activities that we have planned for, for that week, um, including a focus on the, the, the full scope of UDL um, and, and how it relates to classroom instruction. So, um, well, do you want to pop up that slide? So I'll just mention, this is what we have planned at SAS Polytechnic for UDL week in May. And um, we are going to be focusing on, a little bit more on that, um, the full instruction and, and the full scope of UDL during the week. Um, I know uh, 
the, the I think the the session on the um, just looking at what we've got here. I think it's maybe the, the well. There's a few different sessions as you can see that we have coming up, and um, I wish I knew more about what exactly they have planned. I just I'm just going to recommend this. I guess going forward as sort of another area. If you're interested in this area, we'd certainly encourage you to sign up for these these sessions that are coming up in May. And I will end that at, at this. I will end my uh, taking over of the uh, the presentation here. <laughs> I just think it's a love. It's lovely to know that there'll be some more information that will be avail available a little bit later on. Um, you might have noticed during that week that we are planning. Uh, myself and one of our other librarians, Jackson, are going to be doing a little bit more work with press books and going through press books. So. Um, and looking at how we can incorporate UDL within that. Um, basically kind of a recap of what Josie has done today. Um, so if anyone has any more questions. Uh, I see a hand up. If the person with their hand up would like to go ahead. Um, hi there. Thank you, Josie. That was really interesting. Um, I, I was I loved all the resources and then it occurred to me that maybe it can feel quite overwhelming to get started with creating OER. And I wondered from your experience, if you have any advice for ways to sort of start on a small scale or, um, yeah, not to feel too overwhelmed with the idea that you have to create a whole textbook from scratch. Yeah, yeah, it creating an open textbook is not for the faint of heart. <laughs> it is not easy. I would say if you're curious about open and wanting to get more involved is to start by looking at what existing OER are out there in the subject area that you teach because there are a lot there is a lot of great content out there. So just starting by exploring some of that content, seeing if there's something you could maybe use in your class and starting maybe adopting an OER or a part of an OER, or if you have the capacity, if there's an OER that's kind of close to what you might need, but not exactly doing some adaptation. So making some changes and adjustments so it does fit your need. Um, creating an OER, especially if you're starting from scratch and depending on if you're trying to do like a thing, something as big as an open textbook is a big project. So not something to take on lightly, but very valuable work as well. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. I see a question about if I would recommend the accessibility toolkit shared by UBC, and I I would recommend it. And <laughs> the reason is it's it is an adaptation based on an accessibility toolkit that BC Campus has published. I think they've made quite a few changes, um, but they did start with the BC Campus version. So definitely a resource I'd recommend. Um, the BC Campus version talks about how to create OER that are accessible. So it's talking specifically about um, designing OER so it's accessible to students with disabilities, students using assistive technologies. So kind of like a, it's kind of part of UDL. Um, I would say that accessibility and UDL are also practices that go together, but they don't erase each other, like UDL doesn't have all the things you need to know to make something accessible. And making something accessible doesn't mean it will be easy to learn from. So those are also two complementary practices. While we're carrying on with some of the other questions here, I'm going to actually just launch a poll here and invite uh, the participants to uh, take, take part in the poll. It's very helpful for us to get some feedback on these sessions and to hear from you what works for them, uh, what worked with them and maybe what you'd like to see different in the future. So I'd invite you to participate in the poll and we'll carry on with the questions for a few minutes here. And for people who are new to OER and might be looking, wanting to see some examples of OER. Um, BC Campus has an open collection, which is a collection of open textbooks as well as open courses. We also have what we call the OER by Discipline Directory, which is a press book that we maintain where we put links to OER that we find that aren't don't 
fit our collection criteria. So we have lots of stuff in there as well. And librarians on the call, if there are sites or collections or OER that you want to share, feel free to put them in the chat too. I think one of the other questions that I have, um, I'm going to try and frame it as a question. I'm going to do my best to do that. <laughs> so if you if you could give, um, there, there's a lot that we can do in terms of, of, of UDL um, and integrating it. And I'm thinking um, maybe moving a little bit more into the instruction. Um, but I'm wondering if there were sort of three basic practices um, that would help somebody just to to start to move into this. What would what would you suggest would be um, three good places to start looking at this? Um, three places to start. I would say um, learning some of the basics of accessible content creation because creating content that you're sharing with your students that is accessible from the beginning will mean it is much more likely to work with their assistive technologies and can be transformed. It, like the display can be customized. Um, so learning about accessibility um, in things like Microsoft Word, in uh, websites, wherever you're creating your content, there's generally accessibility guidelines that can help you do that. Um, so that would be a place to start. Um, also getting to know a little bit about assistive technologies that might be available and how they work. Um, I mentioned some uh, text-to-speech tools that are available for free in different platforms, being familiar with those so you can share them with your students so they have those kind of options. Um, and then looking at your content and looking at places where you can provide different ways of engaging with the content. So thinking about um, what, how might this concept, what is a different way I could demonstrate this concept that maybe doesn't rely just on a text explanation. So maybe looking for a video that you can bring into your course or um, looking for um, like the H5P activities, if there, if you can find one that fits, so, you know, finding different ways that students can engage. So I don't know if those are small things, but just kind of looking at your content and thinking through other options for presenting the information. Are there any more questions? All right, well, I will share my um, screen that asks about questions. And I assume we don't, we're done there. So um, here are just some information about where to find your librarian liaisons, the LT trainers, ILDC. Um, Josie, are you able to share the slides with us too, or? Yes, I'm just working on putting them in the chat right now. And I've also sent them to Donna, who's her sharing them out as well. There was some fantastic information in there. So Josie, thank you so very much um, from all of us here at South Polytech and everybody um attending today we learned a lot from you this was absolutely fantastic um and it was an absolute pleasure to spend the last hour with you thank you so much thanks for having me thanks everyone for coming i really appreciate it we Happy appreciate you <laughs> take care you too